We're going to turn now to another part of God's Word, to one of the Gospels, uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, again, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like access to one, to follow along in the reading. There are a few, I think, on the back table in the, in the foyer, foyer, or if you're sat next to someone who's got a Bible, just nudge them and say, can I share with you? This is, we're right in the middle of something called the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus Christ, echoing Moses, goes up onto a mountain and teaches, just as Moses was given the revelation of God's truth and law, Jesus comes to give the revelation of God's truth and law. And we've been going through this sermon, small bit by small bit, one of the uh, I think, advantages, but challenges to uh, going through the Bible, passage by passage, is that you will be forced to preach on and listen to sermons on passages and topics that you perhaps wouldn't normally preach or teach or listen to a sermon on. And this is a case in point. When was the last time you heard a sermon on fasting? What are you going to this morning? Because Jesus talks about fasting. And if he talks about it and teaches on it, we need to hear it. Before we read Matthew chapter 6, and just a few verses from verses 16 to 18, let's pray and ask God to help us understand his word. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, enlighten our minds now. Send your Holy Spirit to shed the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ into our minds, our hearts and our lives. That we may long for you. That we may see that all of our appetites, if we understand them correctly, are but a shadow of a deeper longing that we should have. A longing for you. Lord, help us. And more than that, give us that longing this morning. Give us a heart for you. May we find our greatest joy, our deepest satisfaction in you and in Christ and in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, at verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but, your, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Amen. 5,000 plus books were published on this topic in 2020 in the UK alone. 5,000 plus books were published on this topic in 2020 alone. 4.1 million people in the UK are employed in this sector. That's about 13% of the workforce. And the UK spends 200 billion pounds sterling and more, plus, a year on this thing. What am I talking about? What am I referring to? Two. Food. Food. Food and agriculture. Over 5,000 books were published in 2020 on food and agriculture, on diets and cooking. 13% of the workforce work in the food and agriculture sectors. And we spend, forgive me for using the royal we, we spend 200 billion plus pounds sterling a year on food. It is a massive part of our lives, isn't it? We eat three times a day. Some of us, a lot more. It's a, a, something we orient our lives around. We plan our day around breakfast, lunch, supper, dinner, second breakfast, and our evening repast. Don't we? Our, it's a huge part of our life, and yet the world we live in is terribly confused about food. On the one hand, we are bombarded with the need 
for more and increased amounts of rich, succulent, tasty and tempting morsels of food. To indulge ourselves that this is life. This is life. To enjoy the best produce that our supermarkets and our farmers can give to us. So we're bombarded with the need for more of it and better of it, and yet at the same time we're told to limit, to diet, to take care, to guard our health. We live in a world terribly confused about this massive part of our lives. And then in steps Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and starts talking about food and about fasting. What's Jesus doing here? Well, just note in the context what he's already done. In Matthew chapter 6, he's telling us about the kingdom. He's not telling us how to get into the kingdom. I'll come back to that in a minute. He's telling us what the kingdom is going to be like once you're in it. What the practices of Christians in his kingdom are going to be like. And he's already dealt with two of them. He said, you're going to give. Early on in the chapter, verse 2, thus, when you give to the needy. And then in chapter 6, verse 5, through to verse 15, he talks about praying. He assumes we're going to be men and women and children who pray. So, what's he done? He's talked about our relationship to others. You need to be giving to them. He's talked about our relationship to God. You need to be praying to him. And now he looks at our relationship to self. You need to have a discipline. You need to cultivate a godly discipline in your lives that includes fasting. You can see what he's doing here in the context. What verses 16, 17 and 18 are all about are about self-discipline. The self, this relationship we have to ourselves. We all have these three relationships, don't we? We could generalize all of our relationships by saying you relate to others, you relate to God, and you relate to yourself. And Jesus directs our attention and our practices in his kingdom to these three relationships in giving, in praying, and in fasting. And what does he do here? You can notice this immediately. He connects the physical with the spiritual he connects the material the physical the food we eat and don't eat with our relationship with god did you notice that you don't even have to look far in these verses truly i say to you they've received their reward but when you fast anoint your head wash your face do physical things that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your father who is in secret In other words, what we visibly do in this world is connected to the invisible. God himself is watching and looking. And one of the ways we relate to him is through the visible and the physical and the material. We express our dependence on him, our longing for him through the physical, material and visible. And they're connected, aren't they? I'm aware that this topic of fasting is rarely preached on. I think I've been preaching for about 18 years now, and I think I've only preached on it twice. This is my third time. It's even less written on. Did you know that between 1861 and 1954, not one book on fasting was written in the Western world, or so a guy called Richard Foster, who's apparently done his homework, claims. It's it's for almost 100 years in recent history, nothing was written on fasting. It's rarely preached on, it's even less written on, and it's almost never practiced. What is our Christian lives looking like? What are they looking like? What is the practice of our Christian lives? Are we cultivating a godliness? Are we connecting the physical with the spiritual? If you are wanting more of God, do you realize that Jesus is here teaching us how we can get more of him? The disciplines we can put in place so that we can draw closer to him. We can give to others. We can pray and we can fast. What Jesus is doing here is saying we need to cultivate a hunger for God. And in fact, we can use 
all the good physical, material, visible things of our lives to gear them towards that hunger, that longing for the one who alone can satisfy. Let's think about fasting in, in, under four headings. Here's the first one, the dangers of fasting. The dangers of fasting. There's an immediate danger, and it's this, that we misunderstand the gospel. You see, you could just dive in here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, and go, this is what it is to be a Christian. This is how, how we know someone's a Christian when they fast. If someone fasts, they're a Christian. And if they do it in the way Jesus says, they're good to go, all sorted. You would completely misunderstand what Jesus is doing. No, no, how does Jesus start the Sermon on the Mount? You could go back to chapter 5, verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How do you get into the kingdom? You realize you can't. How do you become a Christian? Not by fasting. Fasting won't make you a Christian. It, it, it doesn't draw you any closer to God in and of itself. You must first realize that you are poor in spirit. You must first realize that you've got nothing to bring. That you could fast for a thousand lifetimes and it still wouldn't impress God. You must first realize that you are spiritually bankrupt. That before God, your maker, you have nothing to bring and you deserve his judgment. And it is only by trusting in the king, here, Jesus Christ, that our sins are forgiven. Jesus here is, is not defining how to get into his kingdom. He's telling us, telling us what it's going to be like once you're in. And we've got to be alert to this danger. Please do not hear me by this morning. I am not saying fasting makes you a Christian. And neither is Jesus. Not in any world. What we're saying is once you're a Christian. One of the things that will start to mark and define your life. Is you will begin to fast. You'll give. You'll pray. And you should begin to fast. But there's other dangers and other pitfalls that Jesus alerts us to. And here's another one. That we make fasting an end in and of itself. That it becomes a merely religious act. That it's something we just do. There's actually been a growth industry in the Western world in the last decade or so around fasting. It's become a growth industry. People have become famous, famous YouTubers giving talks and recommendations on fasting. Fasting as a way to lose weight. Fasting as a way to improve health. Fasting as a way to do any number of things. And there, there may be place for that. I don't know. Talk about it over coffee. But that's not what is going on here. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, he's not, someone, he's not concerned about your waistline. He's concerned about your spiritual life. And there's a danger that we detach fasting, the physical and visible, from the invisible and the spiritual. Jesus here is, is challenging us to do it in a way that does that. He warns us, doesn't he? When you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. See, what's the purpose? What's the end to, to fasting to the hypocrites? So that people will see, so that people will be impressed, so people will think, oh, what an amazing Christian Andy Young is. As he just looks half malnourished because he never eats. Well, I've got my reward, Jesus says. You're doing it for an end to itself. You've got your reward. You've disconnected the, act, the physical activity of fasting from the spiritual reality it should be driving us to. There's another danger here and that's that we do it for performance we do it for the sake of others i've already hinted at this jesus specifically singles this out you do it you look gloomy you tell others what you're doing you t you kind of use the the spiritual disciplines of the sermon on the mount to impress others and of course what happens then is you only again have the horizontal in mind you've got no thought of god or your relationship to him that's a real danger isn't it and what's at the heart of these dangers? Doing it as an end in and of itself, doing it for the sake of others, it's pride. 
It's pride. This is why Jesus says, slay pride in your life. Do it in secret. Don't let anyone know. Anoint your head and wash your face. That were the kind of, they were the kind of ablutions of 2,000 years ago, you know, to make yourself look half decent in public company. Was you washed your face, you anointed yourself with oil. It was one of the ways in which you, you, you were respectable, publicly, in decent company. And Jesus says, you keep doing that. You, you don't give away, you hide the fact that you are fasting because you've got to, you've got to suppress this danger of pride within ourselves. See, see the opposite, when, when you do it as an end of itself or you do it for performance, what you're doing is it becomes a spiritual discipline that is no longer spiritual, it's selfish. It's about you. It's about the pride and the adulation that you will get from others. As one person has said, fasting is necessary as a means, but dangerous as an end. Necessary as a means, but dangerous as an end. It serves something else. We fast to, to serve a greater purpose. And what is that purpose? It's to hunger for God, to draw cl close to God, to rely and depend on God. We've got to be aware of these dangers in ourselves that lurk close to the surface in all of our lives when we talk about something like fasting and even praying and giving. But secondly, what then is the purpose of fasting? It's the dangers of fasting. What's the purpose? What are we doing when we fast? Well, obviously, it's an abstinence of food. In its most primitive definition, to fast is to do without food, to do without a meal or meals. It is to deprive yourself physically of something you normally need. We need food, don't we, most of us? Now, I know we all have a, a great variety of appetites. But even those of us that have small appetites still need food, still get hungry to a certain degree. And to fast is to deprive ourselves of that food. But like I've already said, we've got to quickly come in and go, but it's much more than that. If all you're doing is saying, well, I'm going to give up breakfast today, then you, that's not fasting in Jesus' definition. We fast for spiritual reasons. The means, the instrument, is fasting, but the end, the purpose, is to grow and to live and to express ourselves spiritually, to enhance and express and deepen our walk and our relationship with the Lord. What did Jesus himself say when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, this is the reality. When you're hungry and you eat, you think you have put all the vitamins and nutrients and carbohydrates and proteins in your body that you need to live. Don't believe the lie. You don't live by vitamins and nutrients and carbohydrates and proteins. You don't live by... Ben and Jerry's ice cream or indulgent, luxurious goo desserts or even full English breakfast with the highest quality sausage you can get. You don't live by it. It's not what keeps you alive. What keeps you alive is God. What keeps you alive is Jesus Christ. As Paul said to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, we live and move and have our being in him. You, you, think, you think the beating of your heart happens because you've got a healthy diet? You think you'll live to a good old age because you've, you've been wise with your consumption of food? Don't believe the lie. That's a lie. We live. We move. We have our being in God. And by giving up that food, what we're doing is we're connecting our hunger, our appetites, our longings to God Himself. Note again this connection between the physical and the spiritual. What we do physically affects us spiritually. Did you know one of the greatest enemies as Christians in our lives 
is the nibbling of the world. Did you know that? You turn up to church on a Sunday feeling bored, tired, disinterested in the gospel. You get up on, a, on any given morning and think, I'm going to read the Bible, and then you can't be bothered. You find time to pray, and then you don't. You get distracted by something else. Do you know what's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. One of the things that is probably happening is you're nibbling on the world, and it destroys your appetite. I remember one day coming in from a long day. I don't know where I've been. I think I've been traveling. I hadn't managed to get lunch. I wasn't fasting on purpose. I just hadn't managed to get lunch. The meeting had gone on too long. I was in a rush to get home. I come in, and my wonderful wife, Davinia, is cooking this sumptuous feast. I can't remember what it was, but I could smell it as it hit the door. And it's like, oh, my tummy was like, oh, I can't wait to get into that. I'll have second and third portions. But it wasn't quite ready. We had another 10 minutes. I walked into the kitchen, and there on the side, with some Jacob's cream crackers. And I knew in the kitchen, from the weekend, was left over a lovely Stilton blue cheese that goes oh so well with Jacob's cream crackers. And I just thought, a little aperitif, what's to harm anyone? So I got one Jacob's cream cracker, a smidgen of salted butter, a nice thick wedge of blue Stilton. It was wonderful. Seven or eight later, we sat down, seven or eight Jacob Green Crapper crackers with the Stilton on. We sit down for the sumptuous meal. My appetite's gone. And Divinia had to turn to me and go, what's wrong with you? I know you haven't eaten. I've cooked this meal. Why, did, why is there leftovers? You usually have second and third. You know why? I'd been nibbling. I'd been nibbling and it had robbed me of my appetite. That's just a silly illustration of what happens when we disconnect the physical from the spiritual, we think we can read, watch, be, go anywhere we like and then open God's word and we ask, why doesn't my heart soar for the gospel? You've been nibbling. We've got to cultivate an appetite for God. And one way we do that is by depriving ourselves of what sometimes are good things that our world gives to us. You see, it's more than simply abstinence from food. It is a seeking to cultivate a spiritual hunger. The issue is actually not food per se. It's actually anything and everything that will substitute itself for God. Anything and everything that will substitute itself for God, that may grab our attention to such that it will endanger becoming an idol in our lives you see fasting is an act of rebellion against self-sufficiency you could fast from entertainment i said to the children do you know the average person in the uk watches television at least three hours either television i know these days you've got to say television or computer screens netflix or Britbox or whatever it is some sort of visual screen entertainment for at least three hours a day that's average what about giving up an hour of that entertainment time to read, pray, meditate? You could fast from purchasing possessions. Have you thought about doing that? The new car, the holiday, the new television, the new device. Believe it or not, that will test your relationship with God. How much do you long, long for God more than the next thing that you feel like you deserve? There are lots of ways in which you can fast. It doesn't just have to be food. I think primarily it's food, but it doesn't just have to be food. Whatever, does, whatever controls us, whatever is in danger of, of taking our time, our energy, our attention, what are we finding contentment in? Fast from it. Give it to God and use it as a spiritual discipline to draw closer to him. We've seen the dangers and the purpose. Notice with me thirdly the reasons. There are lots of reasons to fast. Jesus doesn't elucidate them specifically here. Although he does intimate some of them in terms of drawing closer to our God. Connecting the physical to the spiritual. But let me just give you briefly several reasons why. Several reasons why you should fast. First of all, we should fast for, out of sorrow for sin. We should fast out of sorrow for sin. Maybe you're like me, 
and you actually think quite lightly about sin. That actually, you, you know you break God's laws, you know you trample over his commands, you know you fly in his face of his holy word so often in your thoughts and in your hearts and in your life, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really affect you. You, too, you. you treat it so lightly, I do, so often. Maybe I should fast a little bit and cry out to God for a greater and a deeper and a more sorrowing sense of sin that I may begin to begin to feel how utterly bankrupt I am without my God. We fast out of sorrow for sin. Another reason to fast is to depend on God, to feel and to literally express your need of God and his provision and help. A lack of food reminds us quickly that we're not self-sufficient, that you need something outside of yourself. And what you can do when you're fasting is when that hunger arises, when those hunger pangs come, turn it into prayer. Focus, force your mind upon God, upon Jesus Christ. We so easily detach the giver from the gift, don't we? All the gifts that we have, the food we enjoy, the entertainment and pleasures and luxuries and riches. And what fasting does is it forces us to reconnect the gifts with the giver that we wouldn't have any of it if it wasn't because of our God. It is to express a dependence on him. Another reason is for self-discipline. You see, the Christian life is a call to be disciples, isn't it? It's one of the words that defines the walk of the Christian life. We are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's not a huge jump to move from disciples to discipline, is it? And then to self-discipline. Don't be surprised that Jesus is saying here, I'm asking you to do some things that's not going to come easy. It's not easy to give. It's not easy to pray. It's not easy to fast. You've got to cultivate this. You've got to discipline yourself in this. Don't be surprised if you're failing in other areas of your Christian life if you've never tried to discipline yourself in the Christian life. I often talk about faith as a muscle. And that's what faith is. Faith is like a muscle. It's got to be exercised. You don't, you don't take, faith doesn't work when you put it on the mantelpiece. You don't, you don't kind of take faith out. You don't get your box of faith and go, oh, let's open up the box, put it on the mantelpiece and have a look at it and my faith will grow. No, no. What you do is you use it. You've got to exercise faith. But muscles not only need use, they need growth. We've got to exercise it. We've got to grow it. We've got to discipline it. And that's what we're doing when we're fasting it's an attempt to force the physical to submit to the spiritual out of self-discipline. Another reason to fast is to help your prayer life. Fasting and prayer, more often than not, go together in the Bible. Jesus puts them together here with giving to the needy. Perhaps one reason our prayer lives are often so weak is because we don't fast. We don't connect fasting to pray do that if you want to if you want to find deep and meaningful times of prayer and fellowship with god couple it with fasting say i'm going to prioritize my prayer life so much i'm not going to eat breakfast instead of breakfast i'm going to go for a walk and pray instead of lunch i'm going to find somewhere quiet and get on my knees and pray and when i feel the hunger i'm going to turn it into a longing for my god a few other reasons to pray. And this may surprise you, and yet it, it is so, so important. We're to fast to identify with the needy. We're to fast to identify with the needy. We have no idea how stinking rich we are in the Western world. Did you have breakfast this morning? Did you turn on a tap and clean, fresh, running water came out? Did you make yourself a strong pot of French press coffee? I hope you did. You are amazingly blessed. If you didn't have to walk, fight, suffer, work hard to put food on your table, the vast majority of people in this world would look at us as being un unimaginably wealthy. And when we fast, what we're doing is we're identifying with their need. We're understanding 
that we are amazingly privileged. We can turn it into thanksgiving to our God that we have food, that we have water, that we have clothes, that we have church, that we have fellowship, that we have universities to attend, we have courses to study, we've got tutorials to prepare for, we've even got exams to get stressed about. Because many people in this world would love just a day where they could enjoy a little piece of that. And when we fast, we're identifying with them. No wonder we pray so little for the work of the church throughout this world. Because we don't identify with the plight and the need of the persecuted church. When we fast, we will find those bonds of union with our brothers and sisters in need across our world will strengthen and our love will deepen for them. What am I saying in all of this? What, what, what undergirds all of these reasons? What undergirds them is we fast as an expression of longing for God. It is saying, I want more of you, God. I want to prioritize you more than food or time or entertainment or sleep. I want more of you and I'm going to discipline myself so that I can seek you and find you and go after you. Isn't it interesting this comes after the Lord's Prayer? And Tom so helpfully last week took us through the Lord's Prayer. And he told us, didn't he? It's surprising what the priorities of prayer are. Because as you read the Lord's Prayer, this is the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. What does he say? Feed my belly until I'm satisfied. Is that the first prayer? No. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Fasting is a means to that end. That we would in our lives hallow God's name. That we would in our lives say, you first God, your name, your glory. Fasting is a way in which we can do that. You see, this is why we should be bothered about this. It's not because fasting is some super spiritual discipline that if you can attain to, you know, you get to the seventh heaven. No, it's because we all need God. It's because only God can satisfy. And when we fast, we're expressing that and going after God and disciplining ourselves to get hold of him. Just finally, fourthly and finally, we've seen the, the dangers and the purpose and the reasons. Let me just notice with you very briefly some occasions to fast. One time to fast is when you don't know God. Maybe you're sitting here, this is your first time. Maybe it's your umpteenth time. Maybe you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you're interested. Maybe you want to know more about this Jesus. Maybe you're, you're seeking God. You, you know there's truth and you want to find it. Fantastic. We want to encourage you in that pursuit. You're in the right place. But how about fasting? How about crying out to God? Not fasting for the sake of fasting. Not saying, well, there you go, God. I gave up breakfast this morning, so I'm waiting. Using it, as I've said, to seek him, to call out to him and say, dear God, if you exist, show yourself. Dear Jesus, I want you to be my savior. Would you be it? Fast if you're not a Christian. And how about fasting when you are a Christian and you're worried, concerned, praying for a friend who isn't a Christian? Have you fasted for them? Don't just pray for them. Fast from this is something Jesus says. Pray. We pray for those who don't know him. We long. We long for everyone to come to know Jesus. That's why we pray, because we know we can't make people Christians. We can tell them the good news about Jesus. We want God to do it. We should, we should pray and we should fast that they may come to know him. You should fast when you're struggling with a particular sin. We all do this, don't we? It might be pride. It might be lust. It might be laziness. Maybe self-righteousness. It might be some root of bitterness where you just can't stop feeling angry about what someone did to you or someone said to you. You know it's wrong, but you just can't let it go. One discipline we can have is to fast when we struggle a particular, with a particular sin and to cry out to our God for help and power to overcome that sin. We should fast when we're feeling far from God. This is native, isn't it? Just read your Psalter. We're about to sing as we close two Psalms. Psalm 42 and 43 
which is really one psalm, and Psalm 63. Both psalms that cry out to God. The psalm is going, I want more of you. I feel far from you. Where are you, God? We should fast if we feel far from God so we could draw near to him and ask him to give us a sense of his nearness again. When we're seeking particular guidance, there might be something in your future, something you're wrestling with, something you're praying for, something you need help for. Maybe it's a decision about a job or something to do with your family. Maybe you're, you're waiting for a door to open. You don't even know what door it is. We should pray. We should fast on these occasions. One other occasion to fast is as a church. This has actually been the practice of the Christian church for 2,000 years. I would argue it's been the practice of the Christian church for more than 2,000 years because, as Stephen says in Acts 7, Israel with a church in the wilderness. There should be particular occasions in the life of the church where we're called together to have a corporate fast and pray. When would we do that? Well, that might happen during crisis. I remember as a teenager, a very good friend of mine went missing. He disappeared and we feared the worst. And the church called with his family a day of fasting and prayer. What about when we are, and there's the practice of this in the New Testament, Acts 13, when they, they set aside elders and ministers and missionaries, the churches fasted before laying hands on them, before ordaining them and sending them and commissioning them. God willing, we're going to have our own elders. Let's pray for deacons as well in our church in the coming months. And when we come to install them and lay hands on them and commission them to that work, it may well be a good thing for us to fast and to pray for God's blessing upon our church and upon those men that we set aside. There may be a specific issue in the life of the church that we need to cry out to God for. I can tell you now, members of OEPC, we're going to be calling you to a time of fasting in just a few weeks' time for a specific issue that you may already be able to work out what it is. And we need to pray together as a church. Lord, give us, answer this prayer for your glory. As a church, there can be a time and a place for us to corporately fast together. I'm very conscious that in many ways we've just scraped at the surface of what, of what fasting is and what Jesus is saying here. As I conclude, we need to feel the challenge, don't we, that Jesus is laying down for us here to connect the physical with the spiritual, the material with the spiritual, the visible with the invisible, to know that, that our eating habits and our living habits are seen and known by God and can draw us closer to God or for, further apart from God. Prayer and fasting are one of the God-given means in which we can grow up and into Jesus Christ. And so as and when it's appropriate, I want to encourage you to think and to practice, not just prayer, not just giving, but fasting. Not for the sake of it, but so that we could express this longing for God. Oh Lord, I want more of you. Oh Lord, I'm facing this issue, would you help me in it? Oh Lord, this unanswered prayer, please give me faith through this. Oh Lord, through this trial, I want, I want to honour and glorify you. Whatever's happening in my life, I want you to be honoured and glorified. Are we, are we longing for God that much that we would give up food and time and entertainment and other things so that we could but get a little bit closer to him. As I end, notice what Jesus says. There's going to be a reward. And your father who sees in secret, the end of verse 18, will reward you. What's the reward? Well, there's a whole sermon there. First of all, the reward is God. When, when you fast, when you lay aside food so you can get more of God, guess what will happen? Guess what the reward is? You'll get more of the one person who can satisfy you more than any amount of food can you'll get God that's part of the reward but it's more than that it is something in the future 
Because Jesus says at the end of Luke 22, that one day I'm going to come again and you're going to stop fasting. And you're going to start feasting. You're going to stop fasting and you're going to start feasting with me in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's another reason we fast. Because we cry out, how long, O Lord? Come, Lord Jesus, come. I want to be with you forever in a new heavens and a new earth. That's our reward. So as we fast and as we pray and as we live the Christian life, may we cultivate an increasing and a deepening longing for God and for Christ so that he may be glorified in our lives. Amen. Let's pray. Lord our God, forgive us because we long for you so little. Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us because we desire you and to be more like you so little. Holy Spirit, forgive us because we do not depend upon you as we should. Please cultivate within us a longing for you. Save us from the danger of fasting for the sake of fasting. Help us to connect in our lives the physical with the spiritual. Help us deepen and express our longing and our relationship to you by praying and fasting. And Lord, we humbly pray that we may know more of you because you and Jesus are our reward. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.